Uh, this is an interview with uh, Mr. Vincent Vincinelli. Vincinelli, as part of the Italian American World War II Veterans Oral History Project, sponsored by the National Italian American Foundation and the Historical Society of Western Pennsylvania. It is April 2nd, 2004, and we are in Masontown, Pennsylvania. Uh, will you please tell me your full name and date of birth for the record? Walder J. Vincinelli. Uh, my date of birth is Jan uh, January the 1st, January the 5th, 1925. I'm 79 years old. Oh, good. <laughs> Not too good. No. <laughs> Tell me about um, your, your father. You say he's from Tuscany. How did he get come here? And yeah. Tell about him. My he's dad a came here from... Uh, a little town in Italy, uh, which is in the Tuscan area, called uh, Castelnovo, mm -hmm. uh, Provincia di Pisa. Uh, he was 14 years old, and he had an uncle that was a shoemaker that lived in a small town of Royal, which is about 10 miles from here. Uh, he went to work in the coal mines in Royal. Uh, my uncle, or it was his uncle, let me make it right, I said my uncle, it was my dad's uncle. Mm -hmm. uh, he made a decision, uh, his name was Baldo Ven Venturini, he made a decision to move to Masontown and put a shoemaker shop in Masontown. And uh, my dad had a job in a coal mine and he didn't come to Masontown until he could get a job here in this area in Masontown. So he went to board with another family that came from the same town that my dad came from by the name of Gino Presenti. Uh, and he stayed with them until one of the Paisanis got him a job in the little town of Lecrone, which is about a mile from here. So when he came over, uh, he moved to Mace Town. He had a one room. He was written one room that he was staying in. Yeah. And he worked there. Uh, in 19, no, my mother then came. My mother is uh, from around Milano town of Biella. Uh, she came here. She had a sister in Masontown, and she came to Masontown to stay with her sister. Uh, it ended up in 1920 that my dad and mother got married. Mm -hmm. uh, They uh, were renting a house here in Masontown then, and then they built a house one street uh, down from where I'm living now on it. Uh, my dad worked in the coal mines for 52 years. Uh, he had a coal mine. During the Depression, he had a small coal mine. He had a paisano was a farmer, and he had some coal on there. So... Uh, my dad would mine the coal there, and he had to pay royalty on the coal to the farmer that owned it. And during the Depression, he would sell coal to the stores in Masontown. He never got paid. It was bartering. If he gave uh, a load of coal to the furniture store, we got furniture. If it was dry goods stores, we went and got overhauls or blue yeah. jeans, as you call them now and whatever we needed there, and the same with the grocery stores, we got groceries. And that's what he did all during the Depression. Uh, he never had any money. We didn't do without anything. We, uh, anything, anybody that we were, he was given coal to, whatever they had, we had, you know, uh, the groceries, and as I mentioned to you, uh, Then uh, 
in the 30s, the coal mines started picking up, so he went to work for H.C. Frick, okay. which eventually ended up being U.S. Steel. And he worked in the coal mine uh, over 50-some years, 52 if I remember right, on it. Uh, He retired at 65. He came here when he was 14 years old, never went back to Italy, and after he retired, he went to Italy for three months. Oh, wow. Yeah. And, uh, in fact, he made two trips to Italy. Uh, he made the one where he went for three months, and then a couple years later, he went back again. Mm -hmm. uh, he passed away in 72. My mom passed away in 82. So do you know what year he came in? Exactly, probably. No, I have it over there. I'd okay. have to dig it out. Uh, yeah. It, uh, came here and... it was before world, way before, before world, world War One. Yeah, because uh, the reason that he gave that uh, when he came to America, there was nothing in Italy, no work or nothing. And, at that time is when the fascists were coming into Italy. Okay. Yeah. Was there a lot of um, <clears throat> Toscani here, here in Mason yeah. Town? Yeah. This, this uh, Mason Town, uh, uh, well, let me say this to you. Uh, the number of trips that I made to uh, Italy, I got acquainted with the people, a lot of people in the small town that my dad came from. Well, one day I got a call and a gentleman from Italy asked if I could come up with names of uh, people that came from Castelnovo to Mason Town. And uh, I didn't think, I said, well, yeah, I can write them down because uh, every street here, uh, you know, I can start naming them. There's the Capolinis down there, the Badalinis here, the Chandleys over here, uh, Big Nellies, and I can name them. But anyway, we sat down. Well, uh, back in the 20s, uh, they had a Tuscany or Tuscan associ uh, association or club in Lecron. And one of the guys that uh, uh, was the secretary treasurer, uh, gave me the book with the names in them. And anyway, we put a list together of the ones that were members and the ones that we could be. And there was 110 people that came from Castelnovo wow. to Mason Town. Wow. Now, they didn't all stay here. You know, mm -hmm. they came here because yeah. uh, during the Depression, the uh, coal mines were bad, uh, they were working two, three days a week, had shut down and so on, and a lot of people left and went to the cities. But uh, they were here for a period till they learned enough how to get around and speak a little bit of English. Yeah. Tell me about your childhood. You've grown up, can you, would you, did you, did you go to school and did you help your dad out? And... Yeah, uh, well I was raised here in this bottom, as I call it, uh, there was nothing but coal mines here and coke ovens. Uh, I went to uh, a block from where I lived. It was a one-room school that we went to. There was a pot-belly stove in there that used to heat the building up and outside uh, toilets on there, and I went there from first grade to eighth grade. Then I went to German Township High School. Uh, I graduated from high school in May, and I got drafted in the Army in wow. August. Wow. Yeah. But uh, back in, before the war, every coal mine had a baseball team. So every night there was a baseball game someplace 
in the area. Oh, wow. Yeah. So then how many coal mines were there in the whole town then? I'd have to. Too many. Uh, a lot. You know, every hill mm. had a coal mine in it. Wow. Yeah. Uh, there was Bessemer mine, Lecro mine, you know, mm -hmm. uh, Gray's Landing mine, Galton mine, uh, complete the, the whole town every uh, few miles there was a coal mine. Yeah. Mm. And that, uh, I went to work in the coal mines at 14 years old. Again, uh, my dad had this little mine and yeah. I'd go in with him. And at that time, we had what we called a carbide light. Mm -hmm. it, uh, it would give you the light in the mine when you were working and the hat was a canvas hat with a beak on it and you hung the carbide light on it. Uh, I... Uh, when come home after school or on days we were off on a weekend, uh, I'd go work with him in the coal mine. Yeah. How, how, how big was the coal mine he had? Was it fairly large or? I, well, he, it, it was it was his coal mine. He it was his coal mine. It wasn't that large. It was yeah. probably compared to the larger mines. Mm. Uh, you know, it probably went in there. Five six hundred feet, okay, and the entries on them were ten feet wide, and mm -hmm. depend because uh, he had two coal mines. One was what we called the Pittsburgh Seam of Coal, which is nine feet high. Mm -hmm. Then he also had a coal mine in what we called the Sewickley Seam, which was five feet high. On it, so uh, you know we just drove the tunnels in as you loaded the coal. You went in, drove your tunnels in, and you're cross tunnels and uh, till he mined it out. Then he'd find another block and that's when he went to the Swickley. First he was in the Pittsburgh. Tell me about some of the, um, some the traditions, uh, Italian traditions you grew up in your family, food or yeah, uh, well, in, holidays. In, and, yeah, in Mason Town the, here uh, again after the, uh, well, let me back up. 1922, there was a strike here in in the coal mine of what they call Lecron. Uh There were people going around in Aston. Uh, there'd be a, a, a fellow that spoke uh, uh, American and could speak Italian. And he'd talk to the Italians, and then there were Slovaks and Polak, Polish, uh, and different nationalities. Uh, they had a representative that would approach people to get them to sign a union card. They were trying to organize the union. And uh, anyway, the ones that signed the union card, nobody was supposed to be aware of it, but word got out, and anyone that uh, lived in the company house. If you worked in a coal mine, you could rent a company house. And uh, anyone that lived in the company house that signed that union contract, they send uh, deputies, uh, the police, uh, the company police, okay. and moved all their stuff outside on the road. Hmm. So right down here, the houses weren't down there then, was uh, what they called Tent City. The people were living in tents. Because they there. got kicked out by the company, because they joined the union. Because you signed a union yeah. card, yeah. Huh. So, uh, you know, things were pretty rough then. Nobody was working, and uh, at that time there wasn't unemployment. Yeah. Uh, then later on in years, they did have what they called the relief station up here where people went up. But, uh, yeah. My dad always had a garden. And uh, always could sell a load of coal, uh, he, yeah. even though he went to work uh, for uh, a coal company. On the weekends, he'd load a truck of coal and uh, give it to the grocery stores, and we always had groceries, no, nothing. 
uh, just to show you how it was. Bessemer School was the grade school I went to. They had a bugle corps. Mm -hmm. A bugle cost two dollars and fifty cents. Everybody in the area that bought a bugle paid twenty-five cents a month to pay for it. Mm -hmm. Then some of them had to struggle. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, some of them had to struggle to make the payments. Yeah. And did did you speak Italian with your with your parents? Oh yeah. All the time? When when the, <clears throat> in fact when I went to school in first grade, I come back home and says I'm in the wrong place because I could only speak Italian. My, both of my dad and mother spoke to me in Italian. Yeah. Yeah. So we uh, at home, uh, we always had to speak Italian. Even after I grew up and got married, uh, still when I'd get down the house, my mother and dad would talk, speak to me in Italian. Yeah. How, how did everybody get along here in Mason Town? You have Polish and Slovaks, Italians. Did everybody get along pretty much? Uh, there was a little bit of a problem mm -hmm. when they were organized a union because mm -hmm. there used to be picket lines and. The picket lines used to come up and holler at people in the house to come out, uh, uh, the coal miner of the, that house, to come out and come on picket line, you know, and things like that. And uh, uh, during that time, there was a little bit of a problem. There was uh, what we called scabs uh, that would sometimes go to work and go through a picket line, but uh, uh, they were in trouble when they did that back in them days on it. But no, there wasn't uh, no problems. Uh, you know, not a, maybe an individual got in a fight with yeah. somebody, but uh, yeah, not that. Right. Uh, in fact, my neighbor, where I was raised down here, uh, my neighbor was uh, uh, Serbian and uh, held. Uh, if somebody was sick, uh, they were over the house to help you. And, and if they made uh, a Serbian dish, uh, well, they'd bring it over to you. Or if they killed a hog, uh, same way mm -hmm. they'd uh, bring stuff over to you. No, they, uh, there was no problems. Other than during a strike. During a strike. Yeah. yeah. Well, believe, tell me about um, what you, would your family do, like your mom, what she cook? You grew up in the Depression, <coughs> some of the Italian dishes real quick. Everything from yeah, uh, ravioli, mm -hmm. <coughs> pasta fagioli. Mm -hmm. uh, my dad used to make head cheese. In Italian, uh, he called it soppressata, uh, sausage. Uh, tripa, tripa. Uh, pulenda, uh, all the Italian dishes, and I still make tripa and pulenda. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I go to Pittsburgh at a restaurant over there sells tripa, and I go to Pittsburgh to get it. Huh. Yeah. But uh, everything, you know, biscotti. <coughs> <coughs> she made. Uh, uh, pizza, but we didn't call it pizza. I don't remember what we called yeah. it. It was a, like a fried bread or... Uh -huh. <coughs> and they used to, my dad always had a big garden and my mom used to can all the stuff. And she made tomato paste, uh, you know, canned tomatoes, everything. Hell, yeah. it was nothing for her to can a thousand jars wow. from the garden. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And we had chickens uh, down there, and he'd uh, begin with the coal deal. He'd give a guy a load of coal, and the guy would give him uh, half a pig or a pig, depends the size of it, you know. Yeah. So, by the time, um, <coughs> so you were you were uh, born in 1925, and I guess by the time the war broke out, you were not 18 yet, right? No. 
No, the war broke out in 41. Right, so you yeah, were still I've, 15. I remember that date. Uh, yeah. I'm, uh, not the date, but I remember I was with a friend of mine in an automobile. was a little bit older than me, and he was driving. And it was a nice warm day on a Sunday when uh, the announce announcement came on the radio. Mm -hmm. And I said, uh, hell, I'm a sophomore in high school. By the time I get out of high school, the war will be over. Yeah, yeah. Well, I made it. What did, um, real quick, did, did, you, did, you know, did you know about Mussolini and what was going on, <coughs> what was going on in Italy? Did yeah, my dad was totally that? against Mussolini. Yeah. Okay, totally against him. In fact, uh, in Uniontown, the place they called Shady Grove, mm -hmm. uh, every year they used to have an Italian picnic, and uh, all the Italians, or the Italians used to go there, not just the Tuscany, but all of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember one time that uh, we went there and there was hell of an argument. Uh, that there were some people that were supporting Mussolini mm -hmm. and the Tuscans uh, were against him and they got in a hell of an argument and like some of them got in a fight over it. Uh -oh. And after that, my mother would not go to another Italian picnic at Shady Grove. Yeah? Yeah, because... Yeah, there were yeah. some people there with black shirts and... Oh, wow. Uh, these Tuscans started hollering at them and calling them names and everything. And, and were these Italians from a, a different region? Or yeah, the biggest part of them were from the southern Italy. Right, right. Sicily, Calabria, and places like that. And, uh, there was an argument, a hell of an argument, got involved. Yeah. Hmm. Then we started having our own picnics here in Mason Town. In the, it, at them picnics, uh, yeah. uh, it was an Italian picnic. It wasn't just for Tuscanis, but uh, you know the Calabresis, the Sicilianis, and the rest of them uh, came to it. And there was never a problem. It was a big affair for Mason Town. Yeah. Now, where was Shady Grove at again? Was it Shady Grove was on the other side of Union Town. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. We used to go on a streetcar. There's a streetcar that went through here. Mm -hmm. And uh, they used to have on a Sunday what they called the dollar pass. The whole family could ride that streetcar all day for a dollar. Wow. So my mom used to make a, we had them big baskets at that time. And she'd put the chicken, fry the chicken and spaghetti and everything, put it in there, what we had to eat. And, uh, put it on a streetcar and take off and go to Shady Grove. Yeah. Sounds like fun. So, um... When the war started in, in in 41, you thought, oh, the war would be over. And as time went on, you were still in high school. How did you feel what was going on here in Mason Town through the war? What was the feelings? Well, let, let me go. When the war first broke out, mm -hmm. I was in high school, and I was uh, playing football. Mm -hmm. And uh, the coach was a guy by the name of Tub Rosie. And he was the air raid warden for this bottom here, what we call this, they call this Sandy Bottom. Oh, okay. Okay. So he went to all the young guys and made them junior air raid wardens. And we had an armband on and a tin hat. And uh, now remember, there was no lights in here. The only light you got was from the coke ovens, you know. Yeah. And uh, they had drills. We'd be uptown and fire whistle would blow. There was a certain signal that you knew it was an air raid and we'd come down and I had to patrol the street below to Cedar Avenue there. And you had to check every house. There was no lights on. Everybody closed their thing. And uh, In Mason Town, there used to be a bank building up there. It burned down now. But on top of it was a building, a little building that they built, and it was a lookout. And people used to man that, and they had a bucket of sand up there, and 
fire extinguishers that you pumped them up there. And uh, it was manned 24 hours a day. The schedule oh, wow. send up, set up, and people used to be up there with binoculars and everything else. Wow, they were. And then the bridge that you came across when you came here. Okay, across the Mon Monongahill yeah. River. They even had, I don't know if they called them the National Guards, but they had soldiers there guarding that bridge when the war first broke out. Get out. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, they were. Now, was that power plant up there at all? Was there a different power plant or was there was nothing? Nothing there. Okay. That power plant was put, put up probably 25 years ago. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Boy. And you were a young air, you were a junior air warden. Junior air warden. Air warden, yeah. Air warden wow. yeah. Then I tell a story, you know, you weren't allowed to smoke, uh, or weren't allowed to light up a cigarette, or, no lights at all. That's, that's it, you know. And uh, after I got into the war, and the fl uh, planes would be flying over, I says, uh, how strict we were or how stupid we were mm -hmm. down here and in, in yeah. the service. Hell, we lit cigarettes, you know. Uh, yeah. You'd try to hide it a little bit to, and smoke the cigarette. Maybe not lit it, but at least you smoked, you know. Yeah. I'm talking about... Uh, when you're on the front lines, you didn't do it at night. Right. Uh, so were you but, drafted? Yes, I was drafted. I was 18 years old when I left here. Yeah. And um, when were you drafted? 19, would be 43? 43. Yeah. Yeah. This is right after you got out of high school. Or this yes. Year. Yeah, I graduated in May and I got drafted in August. When I was going to school, we only had a half a day school because school was too crowded. So if you played football or any sports, you went in the morning. Mm -hmm. In the afternoon, you were off. Well, after football season, I went to work in a coal mine. So I was going to school in the morning, working in the coal mine in the afternoon. And I did that until, uh, I won't say June, then my dad that's when I started getting the draft notices and getting called for physicals. And my dad says, it's time to quit. I don't want you to work. You're going to be leaving for the service. Yeah. He never objected. He was fine with you going to the service. And well, he was worried, you, of course, I'm but. sure he was concerned. Right, right. And uh, wished we didn't have to go because I had a brother also that got drafted, you know, mm -hmm. uh, at the same time. Uh, but, you know, you had no choice when you got drafted. That was it or go to jail. Yeah. You know, but uh, anyway, I'll get into some of my service, uh, being we're talking about it. Uh, I left here in August. Uh, I went to Camp Grant, Illinois, which is in Rockford, Illinois. Mm -hmm. I had my basic training there. Again, uh, I was in the medical corps. I don't know how I got into it, uh, but I was put in the medical corps. And they just decided they'll put you there. That's all. Uh, yeah. I got on the train, and they were loading us on the train. Said we were going to Camp Grand Illinois. It was a medical corps. You know, you're 18 years old, and the farthest I was at that time, I went to Pittsburgh to see a couple games, a couple baseball games. You know. Yeah. Anyway, Camp Grant, I had my basic training there. And uh, by December, I was on my way to England. Wow. And you were, you were still at Camp Grant the whole time? You were for your basic and everything? Basic training. And, and, okay. Yeah, basic training was eight weeks. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, after basic training, well, I come home on a five-day furlough. Mm -hmm. Then I went to Camp Reynolds in Youngstown. And from Camp Reynolds, they sent me to Camp Shanks in New York, which was the port of embarkation where you got on the ship. I got on a Queen Mary. Mm -hmm. uh, 
and it took us five days. We landed in Scotland. And from Scotland, I got on a train and uh, went to a place they called Basingstoke, which is south of uh, London, mm -hmm. on a coast, the Channel. Uh, in England, we had training. We'd go on maneuvers and bivouac and yeah. things like that. I'm curious to know about your, your medical training in here in the States. Well, uh, would, would, now that I, uh, you know, now that I know what medical training is available, because I'm involved with EMT training and stuff like mm -hmm. that, it was no training. You know, uh, we, you learn pressure points, you learn artificial resuscitation, uh, learn, learn how to splint a broken leg and mm -hmm. an arm. Uh, the, the training when you'd go on maneuvers or bivouac, I drove an ambulance and stood around the ambulance. Uh, if anyone got hurt, uh, yeah. you took them to the hospital. And that was it. What is bivouac? Uh, well, bivouac same as maneuvers, but it's a smaller scale. Okay, is that like an acronym of a, acronym, or is that just? That's the acronym name uh, of, uh, of, of 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 a training, a type a of bivouac. training. Yeah. You know what it, you know what it stands for? Remember bivouac? No. It was uh, if they said bivouac, it was generally a, a day or two. Okay. When they said m maneuvers. Uh, Maneuvers involved everything, you know, going the obstacle courses and where they shoot over your head right. and crawl on your belly and stuff like that. Yeah. So how long was, was your medical training? All, how long was it? Two weeks, three weeks, a month? Well, the total training was eight weeks. Right. Then when it was, oh, okay. uh, yeah. That was included, okay. Yeah. Then when I went to England, okay. okay uh, I'd work two days a week in the emergency room in the hospital. Or I would ride an ambulance uh, in a community in case somebody got hurt or at that time there was uh, bombing taking place, but it was up in around London and we were a little bit uh, probably 40 miles, 30 miles south of London. Yeah. But uh, the real training that I got was uh, in uh, in a hospital. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, two days a week I'd go in the hospital. The other days I'd uh, be down training. And that, that other training was uh, just out in the field, like you said. Yeah, and, you'd go on the marches. Yeah, marches you know, yeah. the five mile march. Mm -hmm. Or uh, a small obstacle courses that they had and stuff mm -hmm. like that, and uh, calisthenics just to keep you in shape. Yeah. What kind of equipment did you have with you? Did you, you have an M1? Did you give you M1? No. Uh, as a medic, you were not permitted to carry a gun. No. Nothing. No. Uh, you were not permitted to carry a gun. Now, to to. At night, at, the, at night, we had to pull guard duty, mm -hmm. and uh, some of us, at some time, you had to guard a water tank. Well, when you guard the water tank, they'd give you a gun. But as a medic, uh, I had very little uh, rifle training or that. Uh, my rifle training is after I got in combat. And mm -hmm. I was always hunted. I knew guns. You yeah. Know, you know. So, uh, two days a week, like you said, right? You would yeah. go to the hospital and... Emergency room. And what would you do there and your Every, training, right? Everything. Everything. Yeah, if somebody could be in helping people and they wanted you to help, you know. Uh, okay. If a guy come in with a broken leg or something or... Uh, hell, I even watched the operation. I watched now. I didn't participate okay. in it. Uh, an amputation of a leg. Yeah. 
Of course, this was the American military. It wasn't a, a civilian hospital, right? right no, now. this was a civilian hospital okay. that took that took uh, okay. soldiers into it. Yeah. And this was, this was an English, this British? Yes, British okay. hospital. Okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. What was your unit? What unit were you attached to? Okay, I was with the 9th Infantry Division. Mm -hmm. Now, the 9th Infantry Division is made up of three regiments. Okay. The 60th, 39th, and 47th. I was with the 47th Regiment. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, on there. Now, let me give you a little bit of history. The 9th Division made the invasion of North Africa. Okay. And from North Africa, they made the invasion of uh, Sicily. Then they went to England. Okay. Now, I was training with the 9th Division, but I was not attached to them yet. Okay. Okay. Uh, I joined uh, on uh, on D two when I landed at Utah Beach uh, for three days. I stood on a beach and either worked on wounded guys or carried them on a stretcher to the boat, an LCI, okay. uh, so that they could get him out of there. I joined the 9th Division uh, on D5, D5 or D6. Okay, that's what Okay, now uh, they were, just got out of Cherbourg and was coming down and we went into the hedgerows. Now, I don't know if you know what hedgerows are, but uh, they were uh, hedges that held somewhere eight feet high, and it was so thick that you couldn't get through it. Uh, it was probably six, seven feet thick. Wow. And uh, to get through them, we used to carry a block of TNT and put it uh, against it and blow a hole in it. Then later on, they come out with the tanks and they put a blade on it, like a bulldozer had, and that would open up the hole for us so we could go through. Oh, wow. Now, any place that there was an opening, mm -hmm. the Germans had either a machine gun or an anti-tank gun set up to cover that hole. The, the hedgerows were rough. It, uh, wow. That uh, if you move up, if you move up one hedgerow, mm -hmm. they had that zeroed in. They threw mortars in there, and uh, we took a hell of a beating the hedgerows. I've I've heard of it, but so you're talking about a really, a big area, a vast area where just nothing but hedges. Yeah, and wow. I mean they were close together. You wow. know, you couldn't crawl through them. Yeah, and uh, you know. So, Sometimes you'd get an axe and try to put a hole in it, but it was damn much work. The mm -hmm. easiest way to do it, mm -hmm. get a block of TNT and put it in there and shoot the TNT mm -hmm. and go through it. Yeah. Tell me about um, uh, D-Day and where you were and when you got ready for it. And tell me what, what was going well, on. Well, they put me on a boat for 24 hours. Mm -hmm. In fact, when when the planes were going over for the invasion, I was on the ship watching them fly over. I seen at that time they had the uh, what? I'm, boy, I'm getting old. The plane that they attached to what do they call it? Gliders. Gliders. Yeah, that's when you're 79 years old. They had the glider. I seen the gliders going over and everything, and then. Uh, we sat there one day, and then the next day they took us out to sea. Then from the ship we got on what they call an LCI. That's the landing craft for infantry. The front end goes down. And uh, when we landed, there was uh, an officer, a captain there, 
and the medics had the band on, armband, and uh, he pulled all the medics off and says, here, I want you to start working here, and that's what we did. Now, let me say this to you. Omaha Beach was the rough beach. Now, Utah was rough, but not like that. A Utah Beach, they went in and run away a half a mile, you know, with very little problems. But then after that, that's when all hell broke loose on it. So you say you landed on D2 on, on Utah. And yeah. What were you thinking? How did you feel at this time? I was scared. scared. You know, don't, don't tell. If someone says they weren't scared, yeah. uh, I remember my first day in combat, uh, you know, with the, you, you hear rifle shots, machine gun shots. Uh, uh, you think everybody was shooting at you, you know. Then as you went on, you got the attitude, uh, you learned some with the experience you had, but you got the attitude that uh, I can't get out of this. You know, I'm going to have to do the best I can, and that's what you did. But, uh, oh, uh, you know, there was times later on, well, in the hedgerows, where maybe I didn't sleep for two days, and you're in the foxhole, uh, two, three o'clock in the morning, and he says, hell, you can't live up here. i got to find a way to get out of it. And hell, I even thought about shooting myself in the foot or in the hand. Never had the guts. Yeah, and you'd be surprised the number of people, as a medic, I can tell you this, number of people that shot yourself in the foot. Just to get out of it. To get out of it. Sure. Hmm. So I, I just, you were, you had the band on and, this is, and in, on your helmet too, right? You're right. With the... You were, you were, you were a medic, and, and you had no gun. No gun. Uh, and, and so when there was action going on, when there was combat, you were always in the rear, I guess, of course, and taking no, cover. You were, or just, you're you were right with the infantry. You're right with the infantry. Yeah. And, you know, if, if there was a rifleman going up there and a the sniper shot at him, Yeah. okay, and he's wounded, well, you had to go get him. Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay? Now, if that sniper could shoot at him, you know, he could shoot at you as you go yeah. up, but generally what you did is you got the infantry to cover you. Okay. They'd be shooting in a direction where that shot come from, so you could go up. There's times that I picked the guy up and put him on my shoulder and, and, and took him out of there while he was bleeding. Because if I was going to lay there, both of us was going to get shot, you know, and, and I'd drag him out of there. Can you tell me some some incidents where you would um, what you what would you do and to how you treat a wounded soldier and and or can you remember? how you treat a wounded soldier? Okay. Well, not high, but give me some examples, some stories that you remember. Well, I handled during the time that I was on the front lines. I handled people with any type of wound that there was, with legs blowed off, arms blowed off, stomach wounds. Uh, in a town, and we'll get into it later on, uh, there was a town of Gresnich, and that's the town, the next town from Shevenhut. Mm -hmm. Okay? There was a guy with a stomach wound, and during that time I had a Jeep that you put the litter, two litters on the front end, on a hood, and then they had a rack on it that you could put three litters two across the top and one down here on the driver on the opposite of the driver's side okay but anyway uh, this guy got hit in a had a stomach wound and uh, I was coming out and with the bomb craters and uh, the holes where the artillery shells hit uh, you'd hit it and it would bounce and this guy with the stomach wound was saying to me uh, you're killing me, you're killing me. And, and I'm sure he was in pain and concern and with a stomach wound, the faster you can get him out, the better chance for him to survive. Now, I wasn't going fast because I couldn't. But uh, anytime you hit a, a bump, you know, 
he would uh, uh, haul her. After the war was over, I went to the reunion in Philadelphia, the division reunion in Philadelphia, and this guy came up to me and told me, he says, I'm the guy that was on that thing hauling. He says, uh, I know you were trying to do your best, you know, but uh, yeah, no, I, uh, uh, you know, one night I was out on patrol with the infantry and uh, we come back uh, in the morning, like five o'clock before it broke daylight. And I went to the aid station. The aid station was generally close to the front line. I'm close, half a mile. Okay. Uh, there's times that uh, the front lines would be on a hill here, and there's a house or a town here, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, the aid station was in the house, you know. On it, but anyway, I come in and the captain was there, and he was from Sharpsville. Uh, he was a doctor, battalion surgeon, Captain Lally. And I come in, and I was loading up my first aid packs. I had two first aid packs, and uh, he says to me, "I don't want you to go up on the lines." He says, "Go down, and get some sleep downstairs." I said, "Nah, I can sleep in the hole up there." He said, "Nah, get a blanket, and go downstairs and sleep." He says, because uh, I'm going to need you tonight, he told me. So I went downstairs and dozed off. It wasn't a half hour, and they come down and got me. Five of my medics were on a Jeep going up to the front lines, which was a half a mile away, and they hit a mine. All five of them were killed. All five of them were killed. And... Uh, I have a picture of the, the Jeep that's in the book. I'll show it to you after a while. Yeah. Oh, there's uh, a lot of things that took place at, uh, during the hedgerows. I think we were uh, talking about, um, I guess, uh, was it? There's five. Uh, there were five medics that got uh, killed, I think. Were, were on, a, on a Jeep that hit yeah. a mine. We were last talking about that. And now, where, where was this at? In Cherbourg? Or? No, this was in the Hedgerows. Or? No, this was up farther. This was... Oh, okay. uh, uh, after Belgium, after we come out of Chevenoni. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Tell me about um, St. Louis a little bit again, if you could. Okay. Uh, uh, after Sherberg, and it was the hedgerows in which we ended up going to St. Lo. Now, at St. Lo, mm -hmm. on July the, uh, 25th was what they call the St. Lo breakthrough. That's when Patton made the break with the tanks. Well, on the 25th, uh, our planes were going to come over and bomb the Germans. The first flight, first few flights that came over, they bombed the Germans. The flights after that dropped the bombs on us, on the 47th Regiment, 3rd Battalion. Uh, that happened in the morning. The bombing was 10 o'clock in the morning, and uh, we picked up wounded guys till next day, next morning, 5 o'clock. I was never aware of the number of people that were wounded or killed, but mm -hmm. from the Discovery Channel on television, mm -hmm. uh, I think this was the blunders that occurred during the war. They mentioned the 47th, 3rd Battalion. There was 510 wounded and 129 killed. Yeah. And two days later, we got on Patton's tanks and took off, went across France. Mm -hmm. uh, 
would sometime we could if we'd hit a pocket of Germans would be delayed for a day or two the most and then would move on so most of the time you uh did you have your own jeep did you drive or you were on you was just it depends depend. yeah if uh, like during the hedgerows the jeep was no good to you right uh, after we got up into the towns and stuff where you could use the jeep on the front lines you walked across or if you had a wounded guy you carried him down put him on a jeep got him back to the aid station on it but uh, the the uh, aid station had three jeeps mm -hmm. with brackets on it that you were able to put five litters on them and a, l a litter would be a stretcher, stretcher. okay they call them litters now. So how how long were you in after St. Lo? You, you went to the into the hedge groves. How long were you there for? Probably in that area. And doing, um, I'm trying to figure that out. It was in July. In September we well. July. I'm gonna say a couple months. Wow. Yeah, a couple months. Do you ever work? Do you ever uh, work on German German soldiers? Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, there was times that uh, if you had a wounded German soldier, you worked on him. Yeah. yeah. Even civilians. Oh yeah. Because if you got a town there wasn't, you know, the small towns had nothing in them, yeah. no doctors, nothing, and if there was a wounded uh, person, you worked on him. How did you, during those times, uh, you, you saw so much. <laughs> how did you get, uh, how did you handle it emotionally? How, how did you, how were you able to, to get through it? it just, well, I told you, at first, you said no one can live here. you got to get out of it. And you could see you couldn't get out of it. Yeah. So you got the attitude that uh, you was going to do the best you could. Uh, I mean, you didn't take chances, don't get me wrong. Yeah. You know, but, uh, and... Uh, when the shells started hitting by you, you were scared. Don't if anyone said they weren't scared, they're lying. They were scared, or they had a mental problem, one or the other. But uh, no, you just lived with it, and uh, uh, even working all those soldiers that were wounded, or say know, that again. Even this, like seeing the soldiers wounded and and then just dying and. Well, you know, that was your job, and uh, yeah. uh, you felt bad, but uh, you, you couldn't get yourself in a position where uh, it bothered you, because uh, it did bother you, but not that it was going to affect uh, the job that you had to do. Yeah. Tell me about, uh, what was your rank? Staff Sergeant. Staff Sergeant. I was offered a battlefield promotion to second lieutenant. I turned it down uh, on the front lines. If a officer was killed, if there was somebody within the ranks, they would, would give you a battlefield promotion. And uh, I didn't want it. No. Now, how'd you make sergeant? Just, just the way I'm telling you, the guy above me was killed or wounded, and he okay. went back, and I'm the next in line, so they promoted me to staff. Yeah, I went from corporal. I was first to corporal, and and uh, the person above me was wounded, and they promoted me to staff sergeant. Then. What was some of the, the equipment you had when, when you were in the field and as a medic? What did you have on you? Well, you had two packs. Mm -hmm. And it had all the first aid equipment you need, compresses. Uh, uh, generally, if we, in a Jeep, we carried uh, 
At that time, they had metal stretchers, not metal stretchers, metal splints. The guy had a broken leg. Then there were times, depends where you were at, that uh, if the guy had a broken leg or something, uh, uh, you'd make up what we called a blanket splint, roll a blanket up and tie it up tight and tie both legs together and get him out of there. Uh, we carried morphine. We carried blood plasma. And what is that? Blood yeah. plasma. It oh, was, I'm sorry, blood plasma. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, in fact, we carried blood plasma right on the Jeep. That was about it, you know. Yeah. Uh, now, when they got to the aid station, you know, the, there wasn't much they could do there either, uh, other than the first step, uh, control bleeding, you know. Uh, I was in shock, I'd treat him for shock yeah. and get him in an ambulance, get him back to the field hospital as fast as you could. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious, I guess, when we think of hospital, we think of MASH and the Korean War. Of course, during World War II, they didn't have helicopters. No. So, how would you evacuate them? By, by ambulance, of ambulance. course. Ambulance. And as fast as you can to, yeah, there to was, get to the MASH. Yeah, we had uh, two ambulances. Mm -hmm. And uh, put them in the ambulance and they'd take them back. Hell, even in the middle of the night, uh, they had some rough times too because uh, there was no lights. You know, you Traveling in the dark, some nights in the woods was dark as hell, and going down the road, uh, if it was a car, if another ambulance coming back, uh, you saw him before you saw him. Yeah. So how far behind the lines were, say, the, uh, field the, hospital? the field hospital? Probably four, five, depend. Mm -hmm. uh, So tell me about uh, some other stories you can remember. Of, of why don't I, I tell you about Shevin Hood, yeah. uh, where Poncho got hit. Okay. From Liège, Belgium, we went to a little town called Rotkin. From Rotkin, we went through Siegfried Line. Now, we traveled through Siegfried Line at night, okay. and it was nothing but woods and a small road, uh, I'm going to call it a log road. Uh, we traveled all that night and we were going to bed down when the platoon of Germans come walking through. Some were killed, some were wounded, some got away. And the colonel said, there's no use staying in the woods. So we moved out and went in, took the town of Shevenhood. Okay. Uh, that night, all hell broke loose. They threw a hell of a counterattack against us. Color were Germans outside of the window. Uh, anyway, they were fought off, and that took place, I'm going to say, close to a month. Because uh, we were cut off at one time. I was at uh, headquarters. Where Colonel was at, and he was, there were Germans coming along the road, and he was calling on a radio for help from the 1st Division. The 1st Division was trying, going into Aachen. He said, I don't know how long I'll be able to hold out. Well, they held out, they fought him off on there. Uh, I mean, that took place every night, damn near every night. Uh, I told, there was one night, uh, around six o'clock at night, a woman comes walking down the road through the lines, and the infantry guy stopped her. And they took her back to headquarters, started questioning her, and she said the Germans were going to attack three o'clock in the morning. And Colonel Clayman had a 50 caliber machine gun set up on the side of the hill. Sure enough, they come through. And that night, uh, uh, 
uh, again, all hell broke loose and very few of them got through. The ones that got through were killed later on down there. Uh, any movement at all, uh, there was a, a house, two-story house with an attic up, the window up in the attic on a roof. And uh, we had a guy up in there is an observer. And evidently, the Germans spotted him or seen movement up in there. They pulled the tank up and shot up in the window, and it blew him out of the window. Yeah. Uh, in this same town of Shevenhutten, towards the end, food was getting scared, scarce for the civilians. And uh, things let up a little bit. And from where we had the aid station across the road, down the field a little bit, uh, there was a father, grandfather, and a five-year-old girl in a building. And the grandfather and the father were butchering a goat to eat. Mm -hmm. The Germans threw a mortar shell in there, killed the father and the grandfather and his five-year-old girl, blew both mm -hmm. their legs off on it. Uh, we couldn't get out with her. She, we kept her at the aid station. They give her blood plasma, took care of her, and she was in pretty good shape uh, as far as shock or anything like that goes. Mm -hmm. And then the third day, they were able to get out, and they took her back to the field hospital. I always wondered what happened to her. She made it, you know. Well, about five years ago, ten years ago, I, uh, I was working for a German company, and uh, the owner of the company and the engineer came here and after we got done with our business, uh, I says to this, these Germans, I said, I hate like hell bringing this up, but I want to tell you this story. So I told him about this little girl. And the guy says to me, could you, you know any names? Could you give me anything? I said, hey, the only thing I knew was the, the mayor. They called him Burgessmeister. His name was Kunkel. That's the only thing I can tell you. And uh, the engineer says that he went to school in Aachen, mm -hmm. and Shevenhut was a resource town. He says, I'm going to go up there and see if I can find out something. And he did, and he located her. She has two kids, she's married, and she lives in the next town over, which was Gre uh, Gresnich. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I had to go to Germany. And this engineer says to me, when you come over, I'll take you up to meet her. Well, when I went to Germany, he was in Africa, and he was supposed to fly back home. But the airline was on strike, and he couldn't get out of Africa. So I didn't get to go up. Yeah. 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 But she, she survived the war and let her... Has two children, yeah. Yeah. But I always wondered about her, yeah. you know, did she make it, which she had, and she made it, yeah. That's great. Yeah. But anyway, that's, the town Lou was a machine gunner and uh, was out at an outpost when he got shot in both legs. Oh, both legs? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And Lou and I were good friends. And when he got hit, he was able to get on the phone and says to call for Doc. Tell Doc Poncho got hurt, because they used to call me Doc. Says, Tell Doc that Poncho got hurt. Well, I got word, I was down the line a little bit farther, and I got, hurt, got word that there was a wounded guy up there. So, and this is 3 o'clock in the morning, 2 or 3 o'clock, I don't remember, but mm -hmm. it's early morning. 
and as I started up across the line, I had to alert people that I was coming, because if not, they'll shoot you. You know, there's three guys yeah. in the hole. Well, it took a little time, because uh, I'd call the one guy in the one hole and tell him to get the next guy, pass word up that I was coming up. And, and they were good at that. They'd say, hey, Doc's coming up, watch for him, you know. And uh, anyway, I got up to Poncho, and I worked on him, patched him up, put uh, two blanket splints on him. And I threw him over my shoulder and brought him down to where the Jeep could get him. Yeah. And I remember him complaining that he got hit and two broken legs. And I says to him, Poncho, don't complain. It's bad you're hit, don't get me wrong, but you're alive. And you're going back to the States. You're going to be all right. You know, but he kept saying, yeah, with two broken legs. You know, uh, I say it's the best thing happened to him. Yeah. The next town, there's a town that you read that about the Silver Star, is where all them guys were wounded. Yeah. You know, would he have made it? Yeah. That's, yeah. You know, yeah. and the machine gunner's hell. You know, the machine gunner's out there and he's shooting. Once they pick up the directions where he's at, they throw mortar shells in there and artillery shells, and yeah. a machine gunner got to keep moving. I mean, he fires a while here, and he'll change positions, because if not, they zero in on him. They'll get him right away. Yeah, it's the first target they're going to get rid yeah. of. So. Tell, me about, yeah, tell me about the next town, then, afterwards. That was even worse. Rusnich, uh, it was the next town. It was probably... Four miles from Shevenhutten, okay? Uh, the infantry was moving into uh, into Gresnitz, and there was a wooded area before you got into town. And the Germans left us get into the woods. Then they threw a hell of a mortar and artillery shell. When you're in a wooded area where there's trees and stuff, even if you dig a foxhole, you're not protected. Because when that mortar hits a tree, the burst comes down. Okay. It'll come down in the hole. Shrapnel. Okay? Shrapnel. If you're out in the field and it hits the ground, then the shrapnel goes out, but it's not going down in the hole. You can you're safe in a in the foxhole, you know. But uh anyway we had a large number of wounded people there and I was we were putting five on a jeep and bringing them back and the colonel come to me and says hey we got to get these wounded guys out of here what the hell is it going to take you know and I told him I said all we got is a jeep get me a half track and he says uh, you'll have it there in 10 minutes and sure enough 10 minutes they brought a half track down there and we started loading them up, putting them in the half track. Even guys that should have been on stretchers, we didn't put them on stretchers to make room for, to take a bigger load out, take more people out, you yeah. know. Yeah. And then as we left uh, this wooded area, come down, there was an open road, I'm gonna say quarter of a mile, mile, or half a mile maybe. When you started down across that road, that's when they opened up on you. They could see you. And with artillery and mortar shells, they hammered the shit out of the road. Uh, we got them to the aid station, unloaded them, and went back up and put yeah. the rest of them. Yeah. Well, when was this? In uh, October or September? Still? Yeah, last 44. part of September, first part of October, probably. Forty-four. Yeah. yeah. The date was on that, but I never looked at it. Check on, yeah. take a look at it. Then afterwards, you uh, after you that was continued on. Pardon? You, you continued on further into yeah, Germany. Yeah, we kept course, moving yeah. up, and after that was the Battle of the Bulge, yeah. and uh, we were the north of the Bulge, mm -hmm. uh, guarding up there. 
and that was during the winter, snow, and we were out in the field. Even the aid station, we had a tent up. And you know, that's when you rather later for the bronze star. You were, is that when you happened because it mentioned snow and? Yeah, but th that wasn't at the Battle of Bulge. No, okay. That was another okay. thing. Uh, yeah, but uh, we stood there at the Battle of Bulge uh, till it was over. I think at the Battle of Bulge we were close to Cologne, okay. the town of Cologne, because we had taken Cologne. And we moved on, and we were in Bonn, Germany, when we got word of uh, the Remagen Bridge, the one across the Rhine, and they moved us down there, and I'd say we were probably first hundred men across the Remagen, because we had an aid station right in the tunnel. There's a railroad tunnel there, and we first day we had the the aid station there. Then there was too much commotion with people coming across the bridge and everything else, and the shooting and artillery shells were coming in. So we moved up the road farther, and there was a house up there, and we put the aid station in the house. Yeah. Then on top of the hill was the Autobahn, the, the big highway. And from there we went to uh, Camp Dachau. That was the political, where they had the political prisoners, the, the, the Jews, uh, where they had the crematories and mm -hmm. uh, the trenches were dug out. And, uh, now we uh, went through Camp Dachau, but we never stopped. We went and took the next town, which was Mooseburg. And then there was a, another group come up. Space, well, there was another infantry outfit. I think it was the 4th Infantry come up. And they were at Dachau for a day. Then the Spatial Forces come up to take care of the people that were at Camp Dachau. Yeah. But, uh, you say you, you didn't stop at Dachau, but you, no, you, you, we you, went. Uh, now let me say this: we took prisoners. Oh, okay. Okay, we took the guards and the prisoners and whatever we could get there. But uh, we moved on t uh, to the next town, which was I think Mooseburg. If I remember, because at Mooseburg there was a prison of war camp for American soldiers there. Yeah, and we stood in Mooseburg for about a week. Yeah. So you, you were at Dachau. Yeah. Right? And tell me about what you saw. What was well, I seen the crematories where yeah, they had the ovens right, and burned right. them. And, uh, you know, there was uh, the, the stretcher was made out of metal and they'd put a body in it and push him in and close the door. They also had the rooms where they had the shires that they put gas in make them take your clothes off, go in and take a shower, and then turn the gas on. Uh, they even had dogs there. We shot the dogs. It's on tape now. But uh, the dogs, we shot them. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Then there was trenches where the Jews, there were dead ones, and there were some in there still alive. In the trenches? Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. There were there still other prisoners that are alive too? Oh yeah, yeah there was so prisoners they, in the yeah, thing. Oh, hell, yeah, they were yeah. skinny as hell, nothing but bones. And uh, Did you treat any of them? We didn't, I told you, because our goal right, was yeah, to, yeah, right. I, uh, we were shooting for Mooseburg because there was a prisoner of war camp there with Americans in there. Mm -hmm. And we had orders to move on, okay? And there was an outfit come up behind us, I told you, I think it was the 4th Infantry, if I remember right. And they're the ones that uh, took care of the rest of the prisoners if there was any there. And uh, special forces come in to take care of uh, uh, the people that were in the prison camp, the Jewish 
cubes that were in there. So these were special forces, special soldiers? Yeah, they were, well, Rangers medics. And, and, no, okay. uh, they were medics and people that, uh, from the, they used to bury the soldiers, what I want to call them, the grave uh, something. Mm, okay. Yeah. On there. What was your reaction when you saw the camp? You know, what was going on? It was, it was awful. You know, I could, you couldn't believe it. Uh, you know, I heard on a few years back there somebody was on television and said the Holocaust never took place. And I said, how stupid can the guy be? I saw it. I know it took place, you know. And it was pitiful. It was pitiful, hell. Uh, what they did to them poor people, they ought to all be shot. Yeah. Oh, no. You know, uh, was nothing to see. Uh, sometime we took a town, and the Germans pulled out, and didn't have somebody hanging from a post or a tree. Yeah. Tell me about when you got to uh, was it uh, Mooseburg or Missburg, uh, the American POW camp. Yeah. Tell me about that. Mooseburg. Well, we we took the town of Mooseburg and. Mm -hmm. Uh, run away. There was uh, American prisoners in there, yeah. and uh, some of the people I went there and talked to some of the people. And I was trying to find out if there was anyone from Pennsylvania, you know, and things like that. All by the soldiers. Yeah, uh, and hell, they were happy as hell. And uh, then they put some people there from one of the companies. to guard them, and also uh, a kitchen crew to feed them, you know. Uh, they weren't there too long. I'm going to say three days the most, and then they moved the prisoners out of there. How many How many American POWs were there? Oh, hell, I don't know. Good yeah. bit. Oh, yeah. 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 So in general, what, what was your condition like? Were they Fairly good. Much better than the... Oh, yeah, other. than the, the Jews. Oh, yeah, yeah, the Jews were totally abused. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, they were... Uh, you know, they weren't treated good. Right. And that's the biggest thing. Yeah. But... Uh, a lot of the Germans... We're trying to take off, you know, from there. They didn't, we got there, they were trying to get away. Oh, the guards? The guards, yeah, but they, they got the biggest part of them. Yeah. In fact, after uh, I ended up in, uh, on the Elbe River, mm -hmm. waiting for the Russians, and uh, I went back to that camp. In that camp, they had put the German prisoners in there, the SS. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. What did you do to the guard? What did they do? What did they do to the, they just put them in a the camp? And, yeah. 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 Then the ones that they had information on, you know, that they abused the prisoner, American yeah. prisoner, uh, they put them in a spatial camp, I mean, separate, and probably had hearings on them. I don't know, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you said you got to the Elbe, right? And so got to the Elbe River and waited for the Russians there. Now, I didn't get to see the Russians because mm -hmm. we was there for a while. Then they moved uh, uh, the battalion down to Linz, Austria, because there was supposed to be SS in the mountain, but there was none. We didn't see any. And then from there, uh, a couple of days after the war ended, I was on my way home. Got on a train, went to, uh, I don't know how many days it took us. It took us a hell of a long time because every time another train was coming, they'd put us in the siding. 
and uh, we ended up at a camp they call Camp Lucky Strike in France. Okay. And I spent a week in a week in France. Mm -hmm. uh, then got on a ship at La Havre and came home. Uh, when I was on the ship coming home, so when they announced the war ended in, in Japan. Japan, yeah, and we were scheduled to come home for 30 days, then retraining, then go to Japan. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. So. So, um, I'm just curious. I know you said uh, you didn't have a rifle. No guns, but do you have to fire? You have to use it all occasionally? Well, let me say this to you. Yeah. At night, mm -hmm. I carried a pistol. Okay. Mm -hmm. During the day, they didn't want us to show guns with the armband on. Yeah. Why was that? Because of your, the Red Cross? or just, Yeah, the, number just one, the Red Cross, and, and number two is... Uh, if you're going to have a rifle, you're going to start shooting instead of taking care of the okay. wounded guy. Because they want all your attention on... On, on the wounded guy, okay. yeah. Yeah. So, you know, during the Battle of Bulge, hell, at night, uh, uh, we all laid with guns. So the, the worst time when you had a, probably the most casualties would, would be during the Bulge. Would, would that be... Uh, I mean... Just, no, I'd say the worst old, casualties yeah. when we had the bombing. On St. Lowe. St. Lowe. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And then the hedgerows, uh, yeah, that was you know, too. there's guys would come in 10 o'clock in the morning. By 1 o'clock, some of them were either dead or wounded. You know, you, you, know, you didn't know. Yeah. And not that uh, they t tried to take care of a new person that come in, but hell, uh, you know, if they throw an artillery shell or a mortar shell, uh, and, and the, the infantry people, when a new guy come in, they took care of him. They looked after him, you know, tried to help him as much as they could. But the bad things was the mortar and, and the artillery shells. I don't know if you would like to maybe talk about your, um, your, your service and your Recommended for the, the Silver Star? Or? No, I don't want that. No, you don't want to speak about that? No, I don't uh, I don't think too much of it, okay? No, Let me... Not in, is there a reason why you, did, you didn't want it? Or? Well, you know, I got out of service and, and, and this thing was at home. My dad had it. Yeah. With a letter telling me to send it to the Veterans Administration uh, for review and approval. And uh, I says, I've been in a service, uh, and this is, they sent it here, why the hell didn't they do it? Okay? Yeah. But what, what took place is uh, my captain at that time was Captain Borarski. Mm -hmm. uh, and he was a medical doctor, the battalion surgeon. He got promoted to regimental surgeon to a major okay and he went back to regiment one day he was coming up in a jeep to bring us supplies and to see if we needed anything and one of our own planes strafed him and killed him I got the call to go up there. To, there was a jeep that was on fire, turned over, and went up there. And with these bars that they had for the stretchers, mm -hmm. I threw a rope on it and pulled it off of him. He was under it. Uh, and and uh, he was shot through the back. Mm -hmm. The planes come down, strafed him. Well, I guess when they went through his personal stuff, they found this thing and sent it to my home address. They didn't know where the hell I'm at, you know. Uh, I mean, the guy had probably had it. All he had to do was uh, call 
regiment up and say, uh, where's this guy at? And they could have yeah. given it to him, but they sent it at home here. And uh, and I says, what the hell good is it? You know, to me it's nothing. So even when you came home and was it, uh, how was your, how'd you adapt to civilian life? Well, when I first come home, to be honest with you, I was drinking a little bit, okay? And I think everybody would come home. Uh, every time a new guy came home that you went to school with or friends with, uh, you went to the bar and had a few drinks, okay? And uh, I was only off a month. Uh, I was home a month, and I told my dad, I says, uh, I want to go to work. So he got me a job in the coal mine, and I went to work. Because uh, the way we were drinking, and all the GIs had come home at that time, were drinking pretty heavy, you know. So I went to work uh, in the mine, and I had to get up 5 o'clock in the morning, so you couldn't be out drinking too damn much. Yeah. You know. So uh, I went to work. On it. And it's the best thing happened. Did um, did you ever face any discrimination in the army? No. Because you were Italian, or no, 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 no. never no. happened. No. First of all, I wouldn't take it. Right. Number one, and uh, no, I never had a problem with discrimination. Never. Now, let me say this to you: back in the olden days, and again, I'm going in the 30s. Uh, you know, uh, a guy would call me Dago, and I'd call him a Polak or something. Uh, was nothing. Even the blacks, there was never a problem uh, with. Uh, in in this town, we didn't have that many blacks, but the blacks we had, there was never a problem with them. And uh, you know, uh, uh, I didn't know what they were going through, uh, but. In the 30s, they had a hell of a life. You know, there wasn't a, a restaurant in Mason Town that they were allowed in. The movies, there was a certain corner that they had to set, you know. Now, me not going through that, I didn't face that, you know. Uh, now, in this town, there used to be Ku Klux, yeah. you know. But uh, they never bothered us, never. So how, how do you think the, the is there some way the war, uh, of course the war changed your life, but it, it made you grow up more, did it put your new perspective on life? And just... No, the only thing that, uh, with the training I had mm -hmm. and everything, and after I come back and went to work in the coal mines. Now, uh, when I first come home, I w was loading coal by hand. Mm -hmm. You got paid for the coal you put in the wagon, you know. Uh, then that mine closed, mm -hmm. and I went to work for U.S. Steel, Rubina. And being with the, being a medic and the training that I had, the chief safety director came to me and asked me if I would get on a rescue team. Okay. And I didn't even know what a rescue team was, but I said, yeah. And that was the best move I made because that's where I learned everything about the coal mines. And anything, anytime there was classes or new equipment coming in, they would send me to it. And uh, that's where I got my education about coal mining, is, uh, being with it. So but then you would say some of your, your medical training in the Army helped, helped out, no, I guess? Well, yeah, because yeah, being that they knew I was, yeah. uh, you know, a medic in the Army, yeah, they wanted me with the rescue team. And then even later on, uh, you know, I used to train uh, fire companies and self-contained breeding apparatus and the different equipment they had. Uh, I was 
In fact, I just resigned shortly, uh, what, two weeks ago. Uh, for 25 years, I was on the board of directors of uh, EMT, and I was also on the board in Pittsburgh of uh, EMSI, uh, which is made up of 14 counties. Uh, Emergency Medical Service Incorporated. Yeah. Okay, well, we're, yeah. So you were saying about you're in Homer City and training? Yeah, well, anyway, Dr. Kungel came to me and wanted to put a team together called Spatial Medical Response Team made up of doctors, paramedics, and EMTs. Mm -hmm. That any time there was an emergency in a coal mine, uh, that they'd be available. And uh, I said, sure, let's put it together. Uh, I went to the federal government in Washington, D.C. and got them a quarter of a million dollars. And they bought a truck, equipment that was needed and everything else, and we put a team together. Uh, Anytime there was a disaster in a coal mine, I would bring the team there. And let me tell you, it's a good feeling to know when you're underground that there's a paramedic over here or a doctor over here that in case something happens, they can. And with the equipment that they had, yeah. uh, hell, they had a portable cartograph machine, you know, and everything. Uh, there was a mine fire in Utah. 28 people were trapped, and all of them died. But I got a call to go out and help them, and I brought the Spatial Medical Response Team, and they were there. Uh, they went to an earthquake in Mexico. In Ohio, there was a kid that fell down a borehole. We went out to that. You know, uh, I don't know how many calls we get that people go in these caves and get lost, yeah. And we have to go look for them. Is this the same team that uh, rescued the Kew Creek miners? Is that no, the, no, no. No, they were up there. Okay, we're up there. They were up there. Okay. Yeah, uh, there was uh, uh, the first guy. If there was somebody that was sick or had a problem, uh, the first guy that was going to be dropped on there was one of these spatial medical response team guys. Yeah. Okay. No, it's a good group, and they still meet, and I still go to their meetings. And you, you're the guy who helped get it started. Put the team together, yeah, yeah. That's great. Yeah, and uh, at that time, uh, when I was working with the state, I had the connections that if we had to go someplace, I could call and get a plane, and we could fly there right now. Hell, the governor even gave us a plane one time. Yeah. And during the... Uh, time that I was working, any time there was an emergency, a single engine plane or a helicopter was available to me that I could get there right away. You know. Yeah. In fact, uh, a couple months back, I went to dinner up there. It was 25 years that the spatial medical team was organized. Yeah. And th this was when you were uh, uh, in charge Com of mine safety. Yes. For the state of Pennsylvania. Yeah. Almost. Yeah. Well, that's a great story. Thank you. Yeah.